what I'm going to be talking about tonight is two things, really. Uh, one is Svelte, and one is Svelte Kit. So <clears throat> Svelte is a, is a UI library similar to React or Vue. And really, Svelte is trying to answer the question of how do we build individual pieces of UI? So it's kind of concerned itself with components. And I guess more specifically for us is how can we give developers everything that they need to build bits of UI? So reducing that kind of cognitive overhead. Svelte Kit, on the other hand, is a in-development meta framework similar to Next.js or Nuxt or Remix or Gatsby, or if you're more familiar with static site generators like Hugo or Jekyll or Eleventy, it's kind of similar to that, although a bit broader in scope. And Svelte Kit knits together a whole bunch of tech, including Svelte, to try and answer the question of how do we build websites or web apps? So that concerns itself with things like, what about server-side rendering? What if I want a single page application? What if I want a static site? How do I handle static assets? What if I want an API? How do I code split, lazy load, preload, security? How do I run fetches on the client and on the server? So things like that, and that's what SvelteKit is, is kind of for. So SvelteKit uses Vite under the hood. You may have heard a little bit about Vite. I won't be digging into Vite today too much. It's a pretty vast kind of topic, but it makes for a really, really kind of fast development experience. So what I want to do tonight is kind of focus more on how we think that Svelte can help you ship faster. So um, Rich Harris, the original author of Svelte and our, our spiritual leader, said in a podcast recently, the reason you should use Svelte is because we think you'll ship faster with it. So I thought, and against my better judgment, a good way of doing this would be just to, why don't we just build an app today from kind of bootstrap, bootstrap to production? So rather than focusing on kind of Svelte's um, kind of features slice by slice, we'll kind of focus on actually building out features of our, of our website. And we'll see which parts of Svelte and Svelte Kit we can use um, to do that. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll dive straight in. Uh, sure. So you should see a screen now. Um, you're all tiny on my screen, but I'll try and keep you in view. So we have a tool called Create Svelte. Um, and this will kind of bootstrap, bootstrap a Svelte Kit app for you. So this is what I kind of, I've run Svelte, Create Svelte. It's actually kind of some information here. So if you run npm init svelte, you will kind of like get this application for you. It'll ask you a bunch of questions. So do you want to use TypeScript and Prettier and so on and so forth? So I've enabled TypeScript and Prettier here. Um, and we can just dive straight in. So the important thing is like this directory structure is very, very critical. This content folder is my own context. So I've kind of pre-prepared content so I don't waste time setting up auth and stuff like that. But um, this is the kind of the really critical part, this roots. So in SvelteKit, your file system is your routing system. So when you want to map one component to a URL, you use the file system. So here we've got uh, a very nice, very attractive um, welcome to SvelteKit. And this is kind of our slash. And this is our index file here. If we were to create a um, content directory and inside of that we had a about.svelte, that would map to slash content slash about. So your file system is your kind of root structure and you don't need to set that up manually. So the first thing we want to do is we need to get some content on the page. So we're going to kind of add a, um, we're going to add a title, VS code. So we're going to add a title here. So we're going to kind of create a layout. So a layout is a special uh, construct in Svelte. And this is going to essentially give us some content that, that wraps everything else in the application. Um, so we're just going to add a little bit of content. And you can see here without even, um, touching the index file, we've kind of added this, this pengifs kind of uh, title here. If we add a little bit of uh, CSS as well. And these layouts will wrap all of the content on your, on your website. So any, a layout will impact anything below it. And you can have layouts in subdirectories as well. So if you had a content folder and you had another layout there, then that layout would wrap everything kind of in content and below but it would also still be wrapped by everything that's above as well. So we can use these kind of layouts to include kind of code that we want to kind of share, but without any duplication at all. We don't need kind of special includes and stuff like you do with some templates and systems. Um, so the next thing we need to do is we need to get some kind of data. So we're actually going to create, I've got a bit of a, a large collection of GIFs, Penguin GIFs to be specific, and I'd like to kind of build an app to present them all. So. The first thing we need to do is kind of get some data. And SvelteKit has a way for you to generate, to create kind of these API routes. So if you want some API endpoints, so if you ever wanted to be a full stack developer, all you need to do is download SvelteKit and create a TypeScript file. And it follows the same routing pattern. 
So we're going to create a gifs.json.ts. So this is a TypeScript file. So any file that appears uh, in this roots folder but has the extension .ts or .js becomes an endpoint. So you've got kind of like an API endpoint that you can hit there. And I just need to trick Vite into including some static assets. So I'm just going to kind of pop a, pop a little import up here. You wouldn't normally have this issue if you were had a real data store because I'm faking it. Lang equals ts. This tells uh, the start language tools that this is a TypeScript file. Um, so inside this kind of JSON file, we just need to export some named functions. And those named functions become request handles. So if we, here, we're going to export the get. So that means this is a, a get handler. You could also export a post or a put or a patch or whatever, and that will become a handler for those uh, request methods. This is kind of like uh, more illustrative than anything, but all you essentially need to do in a handler is return an object with the body and optionally a status code, which defaults to 200, and also a, a headers um, object, which can set any headers on that request that you want. So we've done that. So this, this exists, this endpoint now, but we need to make use of it. So we're going to jump back into our into our index file. And inside of this index file, we're going to add a little bit of code. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a context module. So Svelte is pretty much just kind of, it's a superset of HTML, so pretty much most HTML kind of works, and we kind of take advantage of that. So there are two types of script in Svelte. There's the instant script that will run every time you kind of use a component. So say you've got a button component and you use it twice, then the instant script will run kind of for each kind of use of that component. The context module script, however, is kind of a shared script. And the reason we need to use this is because we're going to load our data in this script. So we're going to, and, and that data, is, that, this kind of function is going to be run before that module, before that component is created. So in here, I'm going to kind of uh, pop in. So we're going to import the type here just so we can type it. And you see we're exporting another named function. So this named function is a pattern that you'll see quite a bit. And it's called load. And this is essentially going to allow us to seed our page with data. The reason it has to happen here is because we want to get that data before we create the component. And we want to kind of pass it in as we instantiate it. So inside of this load function, you can see just here, we've got this kind of fetch parameter. And this is very important. So if we kind of like just look at what the code should look like, we're actually going to kind of fetch from the endpoint that we've just created. This fetch is will essentially run on the server or on the client. So fetch exists in the browser, but it doesn't exist in Node. Node fetch works in Node, but it doesn't exist in the browser. In order to use the same code to load data in both environments, we need a special kind of like version. So Svelte kit handles the heavy lift in here. It'll kind of this will work in either environment. And in order to kind of pass some props down to our components, we just need to return a, a props object containing the kind of the property name that we want to kind of pass in. So now we just need to use this inside of our so we're going to create, and this is the actual instant script that I was talking about. So we're going to kind of create this here. We need to put a lang ts on this. And so we just kind of like created an interface. Um, and you can see how easy it is to type uh, props in Svelte, by the way. I don't know if you've kind of ever tried to type props in like with React, but you've got to use FC or function components, and you've got to pass it in as a type argument. It can get pretty painful, like if you want to not include children and all those kinds of things. So it's pretty straightforward here. You get 90% of the um, the value of TypeScript just by typing props. And you get nice auto-completion and errors and, and things like that. So we just kind of like, it's a simple interface. It's just an object with name and a description, some kind of like metadata and a type, obviously. Uh, these are just categories of penguins. So we've got cute penguins, we've got majestic penguins, penguins, and we've got walruses, obviously. Um, so we're gonna kind of just actually use this data that we're passing in to render some content here. So I say this, it should, it should show up, yeah. So, so we passed this, this data has been fetched from our endpoint, it's been passed in as GIFs, GIFs. And, you know, Svelte has a, a special each syntax, so to iterate over kind of items, um, just so Svelte can statically analyze it, because Svelte is a compiler. Um, and we're just deconstructing the values here. And we can see here, this is a nice feature of Svelte where Svelte will actually give you accessibility warnings. So here it's saying, you know, the image element should have an alt attribute, which it should, even if it's empty. So we're going to apply that here. We're going to add the description and see it's, it's now gone away. We'll just uh, add a little bit of kind of CSS. We get a nice crew of penguins. So 
you know, with very little code and with only kind of a little bit of time, you kind of kind of got an app. Um, obviously, it doesn't do an awful awful lot at the minute, and we need to be able to actually kind of click through to our our, our gifts. So, one really nice feature of Svelte is an idea of page endpoints. Now, these used to be called shadow endpoints, so you see different terminology used. And essentially, the idea is that this load function. A lot of the times when people kind of create endpoints and load functions, it's kind of just an endpoint for that route. And really, its only job is to kind of to kind of get some data on the server where you might want to make database connections and things, and then pass that data into, uh, into the actual kind of root component. And in order to kind of simplify this, page endpoints work by essentially kind of, if you match the name of the TS file with the name of the actual kind of index.svelte file, so we call these both index like this. <clears throat> and then instead of returning just the body, but the body becomes an object, all of these kind of properties will be passed down as props. So here, GIFs will be passed down as a prop. So instead of needing to kind of to fetch everything like this, we can just remove all of this code and re reload this. And Svelte will just kind of say, well, you've got a TS file that matches your Svelte file. So let's just kind of, I will call that request for you and pass anything that's in the body in as props. And this is actually like, I think 90% of endpoints are probably used for this purpose. And that's like the only thing we're going to use today. So we won't write another load function today. So we need to uh, actually go somewhere with this. So let's do a slash ID so that we can. So our href is now this, this slash ID. So if we create a new route, and VS Code doing its thing again. So we create a new route, but this time we're going to use square braces. This is a, essentially a parameterized route. So instead of it being kind of like a static route, it's going to capture whatever variable we pass in and give us access to, do, to that. So if we kind of type a bit of boilerplate here and click through, we can see we've got a little bit of content. But again, we're going to need some, some data for this. So we're going to create another endpoint, and we're going to do the same thing that we just did. So we're going to create an endpoint with a name that matches the kind of root name. And we're going to do kind of something similar. It's kind of cheating because all my content's already prepared. But all we're doing here is instead of kind of returning everything, we're just finding a single element that has an ID that matches the parameter name. So that's available on params. And params is an object. And it's called on the kind of the value is on ID because we called our variable ID here. If we called it something else, it would be it would have that name instead. So because they've got the same name, this will automatically get passed in. So we just need to add some content to our, um, our Svelte file here. And we'll do another nice copy paste job here. Um, and you can see we've already got, and I was talking about this development kind of speed. It's just instant in kind of like kind of two digit milliseconds, you get a kind of like a reload because V is just transforming the file that you changed rather than transforming like everything and can concatenating your whole bundle. So we've just, it's just a video because GIFs are actually awful. Never use GIFs on the web. Always convert them to videos. The GIFs are huge. Um, we have to mute anything we want to auto play. Um, so we've muted it and we're looping it. And I've kind of added a title. I've got no idea how you create an, create an accessible GIF that's actually a video and I didn't have time to research it. Uh, so a title will do for now. Um, we're going to add a little bit of CSS. Yeah. And so now we've got, you know, our essentially our GIFs are pretty much pretty much working. Um, so we want to kind of like improve the experience a little bit here. So we're going to go back to our, our index file. I'm going to get some kind of hover effects going on. So we're going to add. Well, normally, really, what I'm about to do, you should definitely do it with CSS. So don't do this. But um, it's illustrative, at least. So we're going to kind of track what we're hovering. And then inside of our anchor tag, we're going to use another Svelte construct, which is an if. So Svelte, again, has its own way of kind of tracking ifs. And this is like, really, this is so the Svelte compiler can statically analyze this. But also, it makes your control flow like incredibly easy to see, rather than if we use something like attributes. It's very clear to see where the control flow is. And essentially, if we hover one of these, you know, if, if hover is equal to the ID for any given kind of GIF, we're going to show some information that includes the name. Um, so in order to make this work, we need to actually, you know, actually do something with that hover. So when we mouse over, we're going to kind of set the, the hover variable to ID. And when we mouse out, we'll set it back to null. Um, I'll add some CSS, so this isn't going to work. 
So now when we hover, we can see that we're getting kind of this stuff. Um, and it's nice. Um, but it's not really kind of, it's not very snazzy. So we're going to kind of use another feature of Svelte here. And when I said earlier, Svelte tries to answer the question like, do developers have everything they need to build UIs? That means, can you build kind of UIs and kind of solve all the common cases without bringing in external dependencies? So Svelte has this concept of transitions. And a transition is a way to animate when something enters or leaves the DOM. And using a transition is really simple. So we're going to import a transition function here, which is fade. And all we need to do to enable this is just add this directive. So it's got this, this special transition directive called, and we're going to kind of apply the fade function. And you can apply this, use this transition directive, which will apply to in and out transitions, or you can use in, which will just kind of like work on the in transition, or you can use out, which will just work on the out transition. So if you want different in and out, you've got that, you've got that control. And we've added this kind of a local, um, it's like a pipe and then a local parameter. So that what we're saying here is only run this transition if the local conditional changes. So if a conditional that was kind of further up changes or we change page, don't run that transition because Svelte under the hood will defer dismounting the component until that transition is finished. And that will delay our navigation. So if we kind of hover, we get a nice fade effect like this. But you're not limited to just the transitions that Svelte provides. And there's fade and there's slide and there's a few others, but you can write a custom transition as well. And they're pretty, pretty simple. So I'm gonna import a type here. And I'm, you know, here's one I made earlier sort of thing. Um, so I've created a transition here called Spinny. You can guess what it does. Um, but the way custom transitions work is they, as their first argument, they take in a HTML element. So if you need access to the node, so you can calculate some properties or um, you can modify it, you can do that. And what we return from this uh, is a, an object, essentially. And the object can have things like a duration of delay. It can also have an easing. And Svel actually has, again, it ships with a bunch of uh, eases, all of Penna's eases, if you're familiar with them, which is kind of ease in and ease out, different kinds of equations to, um, to transform values. But the important part of this CSS, so under the hood, Svelte will compile this down to CSS keyframe animations. So they're very, very fast. They run in the background. And all you need to do is um, return a, a string that is some CSS. So we receive a T value here, which is a value between zero and one. So it'll be zero when it's, you know, kind of when it's coming in, it'll be zero to one. When it's going out, it'll be one to zero. And what we're going to do is rotate. So we're going to do 180 rotation, but we want it to finish the right way up. So we're kind of starting with 180. And then this T value get, will get applied to it. So at the very beginning, it's at 180, so it's upside down. And then by the end, it's 180 plus 180 is 360, so it ends the right way up. We're also scaling here. Scale takes a value between zero and one anyway, so, and we need to use it. And again, it's very, very kind of simple to just apply this to, I think we're gonna put it on the paragraph. And now we've got like a nice kind of spinny, nice smooth transitions. And we haven't needed to kind of go and find a, an animation framework or something to do this. Obviously like you can actually do this with CSS. Um, so this is good. I think we'd like, it'd be nice to be able to filter our, our Penguin GIFs. So we're going to create a new folder. We're gonna need a, um, a component. So we'll create that first. And this lib folder is important as we'll see in a second. Um, okay, button dot svelte. It's not a super exciting button. <clears throat> it roughly looks like this. I'm gonna put some uh, CSS in. Well, there are a couple of interesting ha things happening in this component. So first of all, we've got a, an active kind of prop that we've typed. And that's just gonna kind of determine whether or not the button kind of is in an active state. Now we've got this class colon active syntax here and the full syntax for this is equals active. So this is, if this expression is true, apply the class active. But if, you're, if the class you want to apply and the expression kind of variable name are the same, then we can just shorten that to class active. And this on click, you'll notice it doesn't have a handler. So normally you'd have like a handler function in this kind of expression. If you omit it, what Svelte will do is it will forward the event up so that instead of needing to listen on the button, you can listen on the button component instead. So if you actually don't want to handle the event here, but you want to push it up, you can do that. The nice thing about events over callback props is if you're not interested in an event, just don't listen to it. Whereas with a callback prop, if you don't provide one, often things will kind of error out. So you've got to provide defaults and things. 
it's just semantics, but it, the, the kind of developer experience is, is quite nice that way. So next, we need to create our actual navigation. So we're going to create a little nav. Um, I'm going to get a new file here. This code's doing its thing again. Nav. And inside of this nav, we're going to actually import our button and use it. Now, you notice here I'm using this dollar sign lib. And so this is one of the nice things. It's, it's just an alias. It's not too exciting. But no matter where you are in a self get app, you can use dollar lib. And you don't need to use like huge relative paths. It also makes refactoring really nice because you don't have to rewrite all of your imports. Um, so I'm going to add a little bit of a little bit more logic here. This nav is relatively straightforward. It's just going to be a list of elements, and then we're going to be able to filter by um, we're going to be able to kind of select any of our kind of like types rather than just have like one that we filter by. So it doesn't matter which if it's kind of cute and majestic, we can show those, or if it's all three, we can show all of them, or if it's just one. Um, so we've got a little bit of logic here. We're just going to iterate over these three types that we have. And we'll render a button for each one. We will check to see, should we apply, to determine whether we should apply this active class, we will check to see if sort by includes the current type. And we'll have some styles. And now I think we need to go and use this in our index. So <clears throat> inside of our index, we're going to import inside of here. So we're going to import this now. Again, we can use this dollar lib and not really care like where we are or where it is. And we also need to keep track of the sort by in this component as well, because we do actually need to filter that list. So, and the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to use another kind of self shorthand thingy, which is bind. So what bind is going to do is it's going to say, take this again, this is a shorthand, it's actually like this. Um, what it's going to say is like, take this kind of sort by variable, and we want to keep that in sync with the internal sort by variable of nav. So we've kind of, uh, we exported sort by as a prop. So it's kind of like publicly accessible. But again, there's a shorthand for this, which is sort by. So we, we've kind of like, we can see our kind of, but obviously if we click these, nothing is actually going to currently happen. So we need to filter. So the way we're going to filter is we're going to use a reactive declaration. Yet another spell feature. So a reactive declaration is essentially a way of saying, rerun this code if any of the dependencies change. So what is a dependency? So a dependency is any piece of component state that is referenced with, with inside this declaration. And component state is any top level variable. So sort by, hover, and gifs are all top level variables because they're not inside of a function. And so in here, we've got gifs and we've got sort by. So anytime gifs or sort by change, uh, this will rerun. And Svelte kind of tracks all of this. It figures out these dependencies at compile time. Um, and if if something else kind of changes, like hover, it won't rerun. So it doesn't have that re-render cycle that people might be used to. Um, now we need to use this, obviously. All we're doing here, by the way, is if, if sort by doesn't have any contents, we're just returning true. It's just a filter, so everything gets through. Whereas if sort by does have a length, then we're kind of like checking to see is the current type kind of in that list, then we can, then, then we can filter out. Um, <clears throat> so... We need to use GIFs here. So we're using this new GIF. So we're leaving our original GIFs intact. We're not kind of like messing around with that. Um, now what we need to do is we're not actually doing anything inside of the, uh, the nav. So we need to add some log. There we go. We need to add some logic to actually kind of like add these. When we click one, we need to add it to this. Um, and all we're doing here, it's a toggle. So if, if it's already there, it will get removed. If it's not there, it will get added. And that's all this logic is doing. So we're going to add a, an on click. And that will call handle sort with the type, my really good variable names, T. Um, and then this kind of function will handle the filtering. And I think that should work. Right, so that does work. And they got orange, obviously, the best color. Um, and again, that's good, but it's not enough. So. We need to make it snazzier again. So in addition to transitions, Svelte has a concept of animations, where transitions are designed to allow you to animate things as they enter and leave the DOM. Animations are designed for when things are kind of changing position in a list. So we're going to import uh, another Svelte thing. We'll do, it. we'll do it here. 
Um, and this is, we're going to import flip. And if anyone's kind of remembers the flip technique, first, last, invert, play, it was a technique for performing animations where you'd get the initial position of something that you wanted to animate. And then you'd calculate the end position. And then you'd invert that. So you're back in the original position and then you'd play it. And it's essentially a way to pre calculate values for smooth animations. And it's kind of a, a, a kind of a homage to that. And it works in a similar way. Um, so if we, and, and this is like a really difficult thing to do manually, and it really is two lines of code in Svelte. So all we need to do is use the animate directive, and we use animate, and we use the flip after the colon, and then we can pass in kind of some parameters for duration. This has to be the first child of a keyed each block. So this is a key here. We've keyed this each block with the ID. And if we just save this, we now get, click the wrong thing. We now get kind of like, our transitioning kind of values like this. And this is very difficult to do manually. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of work, and getting it to be performance is, is even more difficult. So we're also kind of adding and removing elements when they're doing this. Uh, so to make this slightly more refined, we can add some in and out transitions with a little bit of delay and duration to make it feel just that little bit smoother. And that's pretty good. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to add some stuff that's got like just for fun, I guess. Um, so the first thing I want to add here is a little bit of markup. So just add this. I'm adding this to the layout because I want it to appear everywhere. Um, so if we kind of like, if you look at the very bottom of the screen, you'll see a very tiny penguin. Um, we're going to add some CSS. So that goes in a, a more reasonable location. So now it's kind of like got an absolute position and you can barely see it, but the center of the penguin is at, essentially at zero, zero of the screen. So it's in a kind of a reasonable place for us to animate it. So in addition to animating DOM elements, Svelte also ships with uh, a bunch of, I guess, helpers for you to animate values. And the great thing about Svelte is because there's no virtual DOM updating, you can pretty much just dump values directly in the DOM and let them update. Even if you need kind of like 60 frames per second, that's still kind of performance. And it's why um, a lot of kind of like data viz folks love Svelte, because you can basically just calculate some values, animate them, whack it in the DOM, and not really care about the performance. So we're going to use uh, Spring. We're going to import this from Svelte Motion. Again, it's kind of built in. And I haven't spoken about Svelte stores so far, but a Svelte store is essentially uh, a primitive um, for state management. So it isn't a full state management solution. You know, if you want to use Redux, if you want to use Immer, if you want to use MobX or any of those things, you still can. But what um, stores provide is they're essentially a way to provide runtime reactivity. So those um, dollar colon reactive declarations we looked at earlier are kind of build time reactivity where the compiler needs to see them. Stores aren't, they're kind of runtime. Under the hood, stores are actually just observables. If you're familiar with observables, if you're familiar with RxJS, or if you're not, like it's essentially a very simple kind of pub subby type in, uh, interface where you can subscribe to changes. And it will. And the nice thing about using them with Svelte is you can unpack the value. So you don't actually need to manually subscribe. You can unpack the value of that of that store by just putting a dollar in front of it, and Svelte will handle the subscription and also cleaning up that subscription when the component is destroyed, which prevents memory leaks and things. So we're going to instantiate this Spring. Now Spring is Spring Physics, kind of emulate Spring's physics. There's also a tweened that you can import from here, which is just tweening two values, you know, for some duration. But a Spring is going to try and try and emulate Spring Physics in some way. So we set up our Spring. We're going to track this, this Y variable as well. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to create a mouse move listener. So this mouse move listener, we're going to get the client X and the client Y. And we're just going to call p.set. And this sets a new value for that, for that spring store. So when we kind of like set it to this new value, it's going to spring. Those values, at least, are going to spring to the new values. Um, and then we're going to kind of like add a handler for this. So on mouse move. So another kind of Svelte construct, construct Svelte colon window. Um, this allows us to attach listeners to the window. And on mouse move, we'll kind of run this handle mouse move function, which we'll call this. We're also tracking the scroll Y because client Y doesn't care about scroll positions. It only cares about like the viewport. So we need to add the actual scroll position so that we're in the right place on the page because the way we're going to use it, which is as a translate value, does care about scroll position. So we're just going to add... A, again, another kind of Svelte shorthand here, this Svelte colon sty uh, transform style colon 
transform allows us to just set these transform values. And as you can see, we're using this dollar sign P, which unpacks the value of that store. And then we can just access the X value directly because as you can see up here, the P, it's not a very good name, I apologize. Um, but the P value is, is a kind of like, a, essentially it's an object with a bunch of methods and stuff. And set is one of them, but so is, so is subscribe. So if we uh, save this now, we can see our penguin is gonna kind of follow us around the screen. E even if we scroll down, it's in the right, it's in the right location. Um, <clears throat> so almost done. So close to perfection. Um, I just want to add one small, one small uh, thing. So now we've pretty much got the full kind of like web one dream. We've got marquee back. Um, and now we can kind of like think about deploying this because we need to get this on product hunt. So I've got a Git repo set up, at least I think I do. So I'm going to try and uh, deploy this. So I'm going to uh, get add commit and I'm going to get push to main and this should push all my changes up here to pengifs. I'll open this repo up um, shortly. So now I can just deploy this. So I'm going to de deploy this to two platforms to try and prove a point. So I'm going to create a new project. The cloud, <laughs> this cloud cloud pages process is a little bit tedious, but um, it takes forever to build with Cloudflare pages, but they've got a new experimental fast builds. So I'm going to cancel the build, enable the fast builds, and then restart it because it's faster. Um, we also need to set an environment variable here because SvelteKit requires node 14 or 16, and the default build environment is, is not that. So Cloudflare pages is a way to kind of deploy um, a variety of different types of web applications, uh, if you're not familiar with it, similar to Netlify and Versa and things like that. So I need to cancel this, cancel build. Go back to Pengifs, go to my settings, builds and deployments, enable fast builds. This is faster than waiting for the build, by the way. Um, go back to deployments, and now I can retry this deployment. While I'm doing that, I'm going to deploy to Vercel, which is a lot, a lot simpler. Um, <clears throat> and I can just click deploy. So, and note while these are two, while these are both building, a note about these two platforms is they're completely different platforms. Um, so Vercel deploys on AWS Lambda. So it's got the classic kind of like Lambda um, request signature. And Cloudflare pages, um, all of the compute is handled by Cloudflare workers, which is essentially a kind of a service worker API on a VA isolate running on the kind of edge infrastructure. So they're totally different. And yet I haven't, I mean, they better both work or I'll look stupid, but I haven't had to touch any of the source code. And okay, so this one's working. Is this one built as well? Almost done. So the cell is working. So we've got a nice kind of deployed application. Um, I went through and named all of these penguins, by the way. Like it took me forever. It was awful. Um, and Cloudflare workers should be deployed now as well. And that is done. And so this is all kind of handled by SvelteKit adapters. And it's probably one of the best features of SvelteKit is how it simplifies deployment. So if we dive into the Svelte config here, we can see that we've got this. Uh, we haven't had to touch this at all. It comes with a lot out of the box, as does Vite. But we've got this kind of concept of an adapter. The default output from SvelteKit is really kind of very kind of platform agnostic. It's the job of an adapter to, to take what SvelteKit spits out and adapt it for different platforms. So essentially kind of like, you know, you can match whatever kind of signatures are being, like is there any specific APIs for things like static files on these various services, then you can make use of that. Um, and there's actually, to take it one step further, the SvelteKit default project comes with this adapter auto. And what it does is it tries to detect what platform you're on. Lots of these platforms have their own kind of custom environment variables. And then it will say, okay, well, I know you're on Vercel. So I'm going to run the Vercel adapter, which is an adapter that we have. I know you're on cloud for um, pages. I'm going to adapt to that instead. We also have, we've got Vercel, Cloudflare pages, Cloudflare worker sites, Netlify. Um, we've got a static adapter, which will generate a static site. We've got a node adapter, which will generate a node app that you can just stick in a container and run. And there are other community adapters as well. So I'll drop these, uh, I'll drop these links in, in chat. I don't know how to get back to chat. They're all drop the chat. Okay, cool. Um, so you can take a look. Um, but yeah, uh, and that, I guess I could, uh, I don't know if this is going to backfire horribly. Should I do a, a lighthouse check? 
Let's hit Lighthouse test. Let's see how we do. Shoot. Oh, not bad, not bad. 100 on performance, 100 on accessibility. Never trust, all, never trust automated accessibility tools. 85 on best practices, 85 on SEO. So not bad from a performance point of view. I said we don't want to focus on performance, but that doesn't mean we don't care about performance. And typically, out of the box, you will see Svelte apps getting pretty high scores on, on performance. We've also got to thank the, the platform to a degree um, as well. But yeah, and that is pretty much that. Happy to take any questions or not sure how you want to do this, but yeah. Fantastic, thank you, Pete, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, uh, has anybody got any questions? I know I've definitely got some of my own. If anybody wants to jump in before me. Uh, Jan, do you want to go ahead? You're on mute. That was, that was a clap rather than a raised hand, but oh. gosh, sure. way to start. Um, I guess, uh, meta question. Um, how how did, how did you feel trying to fit that into one talk? Because got any other any other framework that would have been I think would be a war all day. Surely, um, that was incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I think it was important to try and. I mean, we have been saying constantly. I, I decided on the idea before I figured out whether or not it was viable, and then after I had the idea, I was like, I have to do it. And it's Rich's fault. So if it did go wrong, I was going to blame Rich anyway because he said you will ship faster with Svelte. And I was like, well, we better prove it then. If we, if we can't, if, and I, if I couldn't do this, then we're, uh, we're frauds and we need to, to give it up and start farming or something. So I'm glad I could fit it in. I did cheat, obviously, with copy pasting um, and um, not having a real data store. But, you know, I hope it illustrates that you can pretty much kind of go from nothing, you know, and if I can do it, I obviously know the framework and stuff, so it's, it's not a fair comparison. But if you spend like, I don't know, an hour or so with the tutorial, you should be able to get something up and running in an afternoon on a Sunday afternoon or something um, relatively easily, I think. Very cool. Um, Yasin, you've got a question? Yeah, I, I got a few ones, but I'm most interested in how did it come that you started working for the Svelte project? <clears throat> um, I just started using it. So when I kind of started about, I guess it's like, I really don't know. All time is an illusion uh, since we spent two years in lockdown. But um, <clears throat> I think it's like three or four years when I kind of started on, I was, it was V2 at the time, which is drastically different from V3. V3 is when it really kind of took off for us and all the syntax changed and stuff. But I just kind of was interested. Um, I tried a lot of different kind of tools and I wasn't really happy with them. And I kind of started getting involved in the Svelte community. And I say the Svelte community at the time, there were like 30 of us on Discord. There are now like 40,000 of us on Discord. So it's been a, it's been a kind of like a, a wild ride over the past few years. But yeah, I just started getting involved. Um, at first, I was the one asking questions. I think it's a classic case of, you know, it came for the tech, stayed for the people sort of a thing. Um, it's kind of the community that keeps me kind of coming back more than anything. Um, seeing, you know, like seeing people that I helped help other people and then seeing those people help other, like seeing that kind of like network grow and that kind of chain grow and seeing the community that we've kind of nurtured over years and years and years is kind of, that's the really rewarding stuff and seeing it kind of like really come to life. So it's kind of that, obviously we believe in the tech. We think it's the way people should be building web apps, but you know, there's more to it than just the tech in, in our opinion. Okay. Um, can I ask a few other questions? Of course, please go yeah. ahead. So, so on, the, on the more technical side, I, the first time I've seen um, routing in the repository, I mean, the, I forgot the word. What's the routing in Svet? The file system. Yeah, in the file system. Yeah, thank you. So I'm interested, uh, Where? what's the limit there? Can you create subfolders? Can you put things together? Uh, for example, does, do you have to have this index file always, or you can just exchange it for anything you'd like? As to whether you can get rid of the index file, I don't, I've got no idea. <laughs> In theory, it should be possible, um, but you might it might require it. The routing system might actually require it. But um, yeah, you can create subfolders. Likewise, you can kind of create, you know, if you want, you know, a kind of a typical app might have multiple categories and inside of those, there might be like multiple pages and you can keep going, you can go as deep as you want. Um, how flexible is it? It's pretty flexible. I think for the vast majority of cases, you won't run into issues. There are like probably certain types of app 
that don't necessarily kind of like really work well with file system based routing. Um, specifically, like, you know, for example, if you're doing like really strange things, like if you're on, I don't know, you've got like really, like really complex transitions between pages in a very rich web app, then maybe a file system uh, based router could get a bit uh, difficult to work with. You can probably still achieve the same things, but the experience might not be as good. But I think for the vast majority of cases, it will kind of work fine. And it's the same with layouts. So I mentioned earlier how if you've got like, you can have sub layouts that will just wrap content that's beneath them. You can also reset those layouts. It was a feature. So before Sparkit, there was a, a framework called Sapa, which is kind of like, which was basically this, but not as good. Um, and we decided to just start afresh. And one of the things that people asked for all the time was, can I reset a layout? I want to reset a layout. And people had to do all sorts of weird things to reset layouts. And it wasn't fun, like ifs and the, if this path do this, if that path do that in your um, in your layout file, which wasn't fun. So there's a way to kind of reset layouts. I think it's like, I think you put like reset in the, I'd have to check the docs to be honest, but um, you can now reset layouts and stuff as well. So it's quite flexible. There are going to be cases where Svelte isn't the right choice, though. Like, we're trying to solve the vast majority of kind of like the cases, like the 90% case, but there's absolutely going to be times when Svelte isn't perfect for you. I think that most apps won't hit that. Um, and I'd encourage, um, you know, in future, we will be spacing, like kind of pointing people to Svelte. Like, Svelte is the way to build Svelte apps. That's kind of what we're going to be saying. Obviously, with the caveat, it's currently in beta, so things could change. Um, but when it's going to release, we're going to have to absolutely push people there. But that doesn't mean it's always going to be the case. And I, I know of some complex cases where it probably isn't the best solution right now. Um, like if you're working with a micro from 10 based architecture, for example, currently SvelteKit doesn't particularly jive with that. And that is becoming increasingly popular, like large kind of enterprise organizations. Having implemented <laughs> such an architecture myself, I know how kind of popular it's becoming. And for that case, SvelteKit doesn't currently work, although there are issues around it and we do hope to improve kind of that side of things. So, you know, as we get more use cases, like real world use cases, we can try to solve for them. But, you know, it, it won't solve everything. And the same is true of file-based routing. It's it can be challenging in certain kind of situations and programmatic routers and declarative routers are sometimes more flexible. Okay, thank you. Cool, um, we've got some questions in the chat, but um, whilst you're talking about routing, I just wanted to jump in, um, jump in there, Pete. If you, uh, is the, presumably you've got this sort of routing engine, which is resolving a request or a recruit to your file system or sort of, you know, convention-based system. Does that slow down? Does does it resolve them on request, or does when the app starts, does it make a list of your entire folder structure and just cache that sort of? Yeah. So it essentially builds a manifest at build time. So we'll look at all of the routes and we'll kind of create a manifest. And this kind of like depending on what's in your file system, like mm. things will change slightly. So for example, this idea of page endpoints mapping directly to kind of normal kind of page routes, like yeah. that's obviously something that's kind of worked out, and the logic is slightly different. But yeah, so we generate a manifest. Now that manifest, there's actually been kind of requests to make that manifest kind of part of an API so that we can, you know, allow people to modify it. At the minute, that's not possible. Um, it's totally internal. But yeah, so obviously if you have a really huge manifest, that obviously could become a very big kind of uh, big thing. I think in most cases, even in large apps, that's probably not going to be a huge concern, at least not for a long time. Um, but obviously if that problem comes up, we can try and, you know, I've kind of thought in the past about, you know, being able to, chunk manifests and actually lazy load your manifest. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's still in pre-release. So if, if, if people have kind of thoughts on that, file an issue. <laughs> but it does that, it does it once at build time and then everything after that is instantaneous essentially. Yeah, it's essentially just a, a kind of like a constant time lookup. Yeah, brilliant. And the um, the example you had there, you had obviously had a, um, you know, slash images slash, you have square brackets for a parameter for ID. Presumably you can have a folder called parameter square ID and then sub bits of that as well, can you? Yeah, and you can do other, um, I think, did we get rid of regex routes? But you can have like, there's quite a lot on, on routes that I didn't cover. Um, so yeah, you can have parameterized folders because, because so if you have like, I so I kind of like had, so if you have, I'm trying to think this in my head, but if you have like um, a situation like this, you could have, instead of having square bracket ID, you could have square bracket folder, and then an index dot felt and it, and it essentially maps to the that's same what thing. I was that's what I was thinking of an example app I'm working on it would need that it's got you know 
slash ID, and that would be a page, and then slash ID slash images or that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And, and I think the way the routing works internally is it will kind of like more specific routes take precedence over less specific routes. So if right. you had like, yeah. you could have an ID, but you could also have like a static route, like that says like about alongside it. And it will match that one first if there's an about. So that won't get gotcha. accidentally passed to the parameterized one. So. Very cool. Okay, we've got some questions in the chat. So um, one from Janosch says, uh, during server-side rendering, does the crawler render pages that aren't linked to from any other pages? Um, so I think this is referencing uh, the static generation. Um, so when you statically generate a site, you build the site as if it's like a node app, and then we essentially kind of like we'll go and kind of like look at each, we'll basically have an entry point and then we'll go and like crawl every URL. And then we will take a snapshot of that HTML and that becomes our static HTML. Um, so to answer that question, the uh, answer to that question is, I don't know, but what I do know is that in SAPA, you could essentially kind of provide it with additional um, kind of entry points. So if you had things that weren't actually directly kind of like reachable via a URL, you could provide it with additional entry points so that it could indeed find them. Um, so SAPA definitely had that. Um, and, and I know that it had that because it didn't have it and people complained about it a lot and then I implemented it. So I imagine that is kind of like the feature of self in some way. Um, and if it's not, that's a regression really. Um, but yeah, that should, yeah. that should be possible. Cool. Um, we had one from James here, um, which a couple of people have jumped in. Uh, Salt is a compiler. What is Svelte written in? I'd love to know more about its architecture. Yeah, and you're not the only one. Um, so we've not just got the architecture <laughs> documented anywhere. So Svelte's written in JavaScript. Well, it's written in TypeScript. Um, and obviously a hot topic at the minute is rewriting tooling in various languages. So I actually have uh, a library of my own called MD Specs, which is kind of like MDX for Svelte. It's a way to combine Markdown and Svelte together. And I'm actually rewriting it currently in Rust. So this is a kind of a hot topic and I have kind of some very specific reasons for that. And it's kind of a, something we've been discussing, you know, should we rewrite the compiler in a different language? Like, would that make sense? And there are definite benefits to it, but there's also huge trade-offs in terms of contribution and community and stuff like that. So we don't know. Um, it's often the kind of the case, like for this kind of like lower level tooling that almost acts as infrastructure. It sometimes makes sense to make that stuff as, as fast as possible, but on the same token, it's only going to be as fast as the slowest part in your chain. So like, for example, Svelte has preprocessors that might run. So if you're kind of like want to use SCSS, you need to preprocess your SCSS to CSS so Svelte can understand it. So if your preprocessors are really slow, it doesn't really matter how fast we make the compiler, you're still going to slow everything down. So mm -hmm. yet to be determined. Currently, TypeScript, in the future, we'll write parts in another language or maybe all of it. Who knows? Very cool. Well, I know James um, himself has worked on projects where he's worked on, you know, various different, uh, the core parts working in Rust and then various different parts on top. So he might be a good resource too, a good brain to pick on that one. Yeah, and there's other, lots of different languages, Zig and all kinds of stuff. Go, obviously, ES builds written in Go and that's fast. I mean, I think as well, it's like, we don't want to, people kind of think, oh, why don't you use a fast language? But like, sure, some languages are faster, but you can still write slow code in fast languages. Like your yeah. design matters a lot as well. And I think the reason ES build is so fast is because Evan refuses to add like loads of random features to it. So yes, mm -hmm. Go is fast. Yes, it kind of like it's really easy to kind of, you know, with Go routines and stuff to, to, to use multiple calls and stuff. But also he's very strict about design and what goes in and what doesn't. And he's mm -hmm. very kind of clear that, you know, this might not work for everyone. Like that. So, you know, you've got to make sure <clears throat> that you kind of get all of those things right as well. Oh, and um, we've got a couple more. I'm trying not to lose them in the chat. Um, uh, Janosch has a follow-up question. Uh, thank you for your answers. One more thing. Does the crawler find non-static links? If I find some data and render links from those, does the crawler find them? I mean, is, is the crawler like, I mean, since like Rich is in the chat, but like, I don't know if the crawler is still like literally a node app. So the way it like used to work was it would literally run your app. So if, it's, if it exists, like when a user would hit it, it could snapshot that page. Like I'm not 100%, that, that kind of approach can be slow. So I'm not 100% if we're still using that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure, um, but yeah, follow, follow up in Discord and we'll tell you. 
Okay, cool. Um, uh, do you want to share some links to that, by the way, if you've got um, uh, a Discord or a Slack team you'd like people to... Uh, yeah, sorry. To yeah, those so who are interested to join in on? Should. I guess I should uh, link. Spelt docs. So there's our spelt docs. Lovely. Which are lovely. And we've got... And so the chat is... There should be a link there somewhere. Oh, there it is. It's got a stupid icon. This is our chat, so that takes to Discord. Brilliant, thank you. And felt kit docs. Oh. Um, we do not incrementally compile currently. I'm not sure we've discussed it much. I think like it's it's come up occasionally, but um, we haven't. I mean, currently all efforts are on felt kit, so we are like kind of early brainstorming like what might happen in a future salt version and there's lots not just kind of uh under the hood and there's lots we might do but the focus currently is getting kit to 1.0 um and nothing else is really um on the radar at the minute cool um does anyone have any oh sorry i've just seen um yes you put your hand up again go ahead yeah i wanted to ask do you have any plans to create something like coding guidelines because I really like your approach and how you think and how you want people to write applications. And I'm, as I already told you, I'm like learning for four days and I'm hitting all these kind of very small walls. Should I use TypeScript? Why not? Why yes? Where should I put uh, different things? And all these kind of things, like I feel it would be really helpful for new people, for you guys to say, hey, this is what we created and we would use it this way. Um, Best practices it, type stuff. Yeah. yeah. So this is kind of, this has come up before and we're kind of in two minds about it. So kind of partly, yes, I think we'd like to kind of provide more documentation on things like, and we actually discussed this very recently about how to get the most out of TypeScript. TypeScript in Svelte is like a really... Um, is actually really, really nice. And it's much nicer than using TypeScript in some other contexts without mentioning names. And we would like to document like how to get the most out of TypeScript without your code base becoming an absolute mess. And, and there are lots of different opinions about TypeScript on, on the core team as well, about whether we should use it at all versus like how heavily you should use it and stuff. So um, we might have to fight it out internally before we could come up with that document. But I think that we're reluctant to kind of put like, uh, there's a lot of very strong opinions in the core team and they're not always necessarily, they don't always necessarily follow what's popular in the ecosystem. So for, as an example, just to, I guess, kind of set the tone, all of the variable names inside a spell kit are um, snake case, but all of our public API is camel case because we think snake case is far easier to read and we've got science to back us up, but the, the ecosystem doesn't agree, right? So, and it's the same with best practices. There's a like, I mean, so for example, one of the things that I think is like a, a scourge upon the, the JavaScript ecosystem is the Airbnb uh, ESLint kind of style guide. Like, I think they're awful. And yet that's very, very popular. So we don't want to go down the route of saying, hey, here's a bunch of really, really good opinions. Some of which are kind of like solid and some of which like are maybe a bit more opinion-based and dubious. And then have everyone hate us or people kind of like come up against like loads of problems like with those kind of guides. So we'd rather focus on kind of stuff that like we have some kind of confidence is kind of based at least to some degree in fact. You know, like, and I feel like when you start kind of talking about best practices, it starts to just become a bit of a tip for that opinion thing. And, and, but that said, there's obviously kind of like a need for some guidance on certain things. I think maybe kind of, um, documenting patterns. And I think here, this is where Svelte Society, which is kind of a sister organization to Svelte, who kind of do a lot of community events. They organize the Svelte conference and stuff. Let me find a link to the, the site that's currently being rebuilt. But Svelte Society might be a better place for this um, for this kind of thing. Um, recipes, a cookbook, if you will, um, for you know how to solve certain types of problems. Um, but best practices, style guides, not sure. Not from the core team, probably. Cool. I mean, on a, um, a related note, I was uh, you may you may able to do, you know do this uh, very cool demo app, and you you know you're able to do animations, you did state management, you did events, you did all of these things, and you didn't need to step outside Svelte. What comes out of the box? How well being someone you know of a 
you know, in, in the front end world, I work with React, and it's just implied that you, of course, use React Router and do this and then you, you've installed 15 packages before you do anything else just to get a bloody website up, you know. How well does Svelte play with, does it play with others nicely? If you decided, I don't like the way that animations work out of the box, I want to use this library instead, or uh, I didn't particularly enjoy the way that you've that, that, that you're expected to do routing. I want to do it this way. Are you? Can you swap parts out, or is it like this is how it works? Do it that way. It depends. Um, so routing and Svelte are kind of a thing. So that so, like file system based routing is very important. Now you can, if you want to, you could um, pull in. So like there are a bunch of kind of routing libraries for Svelte. So there's like. There's some kind of declarative ones, which are kind of XML based. There's some programmatic ones that you can use. I've successfully used things like Navaid, which is uh, Luke, uh, Luke Edwards, um, his kind of router, really nice, really simple, really small. I've used Felt Routing, which is another uh, declarative router. And if you wanted to, if you really, really wanted to, you could stuff one in your index file and handle all of your routes. But you're going to miss out on like all kinds of things. You're going to have to make sure it's SSR aware. You're going to miss out on like the nice kind of endpoints and stuff. So. The file system based routing is probably the one thing that is pretty fixed. And if that isn't working for you, you're going to need to use something else. But I would, I would argue, like, I would like to hear why it's not working, though. Come and file an issue sure. and tell us why. But I think other stuff, though, probably works better in Svelte than it does in a tool like React. So in React, you need a custom wrapper for everything. And the reason you need that custom wrapper is because of the re render cycles and stuff. So you need to make sure that you know, use kind of constant references and put, wrap things in hooks to ensure that you can keep hold of these values over time. Or as is the case of something like um, various kind of like stuff like React Spring and stuff like um, React 3 Fiber, just opt out of the kind of the re-render cycle altogether and take control of that piece of DOM. Um, yeah. You don't really need to do that in Svelte because components don't re-render. A component re-renders once and then the updates are granular. You What, what you tell to update, updates. So if you kind of bring in an animation library and instantiate it inside of your, at the root level of your kind of your script, mm -hmm. that's it. It's going to do it once. And then you can mess around with the DOM as much as you want. And mm -hmm. I actually remember, um, I don't know if anyone's used, what's it called? XState, the kind of state machine library. It's kind of like a way to declare state machines and work with state machines in, in JavaScript. It's quite a nice library. Um, and uh, David, who, who wrote the library, kind of has a kind of a custom React implementation. He kind of actually said on Twitter, like, the reason there's a custom React implementation and not others is we don't actually need one for Svelte because it just works. But for mm -hmm. React, we actually need the custom kind of wrapper. So for a lot of libraries, there isn't a Svelte version, but mm -hmm. you often kind of don't need one and you can just use the vanilla version. Fair enough. Cool. Thank you. Um, I've got lots more questions I would ask, but I don't want to hog uh, the time. So um, Antonio has asked, some opinions will potentially... Uh, some opinions were essentially built into Svelte itself, like the talk around a formal form element. So I suppose this is harking back to the question about conventions and coding standards. Even though you say we don't want to lecture you on how to do things, presumably some things are, there is a way to do it or a, a standard. Yeah. Um, Svelte's a very opinionated tool. Like, you know, I say we don't want to, you know, we don't want to kind of like things like, when should you break out into a new component? Like, what should you do with your styling? Like, how should you handle kind of these kinds of variables or whatever? Like, should you use, um, you know, function expressions or function declarations and blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. It's not on us to talk about that. Svelte so does come with opinions about like how kind of code should be written. So I think this, this form element, this feels like, um, a, the form element that was designed basically to allow SvelteKit uh, kind of forms to be progressively enhanced. That's what it kind of sounds like. And there is basically talk of should we have uh, like a form element in SvelteKit so that we can, because you know the, the story with uh, progressive enhancement and forms is that nobody does anymore. You know, whereas previously you would kind of like, you'd have the action and you'd intercept that action. That's the proper way to do a form. That's actually incredibly difficult to do in a modern framework. So we kind of like thought progressive enhancement is important to us and we'd like to encourage it more. And to make that easy in kind of like a SvelteKit world, should we have a form element that kind of enables that? And, you know, maybe we will do that. And maybe there are other kind of instances where, because in order, like when you start using kind of normal form elements and doing progressive enhancement, you've got to think about um, cross-site 
request forgery and stuff like that as well, uh, which you don't have to when you're doing pure JavaScript forms and stuff. So there's a kind of a, that's a bit of a, a kind of worms that one. But yeah, like we're not against kind of saying this is the way you should do a thing, but we're not going to do that kind of like willy nilly. Like if we don't think that it's valuable, we don't think there's some kind of like genuine um, benefit, then we won't. But we, we're kind of happy to have opinions and force them on all of our users. That happens all the time. Uh, mm. Well, I don't think you're not, you're not the first um, team to have built a, a library that is opinionated, and that's that's a good. That's it's done for the right reasons. It's not to, to throw people out. It's to say this is the way we think you should use this. You know. Yeah. One one of the examples I often give, I can never find the articles now, but they used to be quite common. Is like we have one way to do conditional stuff. We we have our like little if block, and that's it. And I and when people go, oh, I don't like it. I enjoy linking to the here are the 12 ways you can conditionally render a component in React, you know? And yeah. I just think that that's just one of the, one of the kind of like guidelines when we were actually building Svelte 3, which is like most of this design is, is, is from Svelte 3, was like the Zen of Python. And one of the kind of the key things was this idea that having one way to do things, you know, trying mm -hmm. to minimize the amount of ways there are to do things. Good point, you know, yeah. sim simple is better than complex, complex is better than complicated. Those kinds of ideas definitely run through Svelte. And so we do have, in certain cases, there's basically one way to do things. You know, in reality, there's lots of ways to do things. You've still got most sure. of the power of JavaScript. But yeah, we do try to kind of uh, trim things down. So, and the nice thing about it is that if you go, and I've worked on a lot of uh, React code bases in my career. I was a contractor for a long time, so I saw a lot of code bases. And it's like, honestly, it's like being, a, it's like day one at school every single time you join a company because everyone writes their code differently. What's nice about Svelte is you do get different styles still. But the template itself, it's like there's not a, you don't have a lot of movement there. So you tend to kind of, you, you see a Svelte code base and you pretty much know what's happening straight off the bat. Mm. And you don't need to piece too much together because it's very familiar and the patterns are very familiar because it's very hard to escape them. And I, so I see that, that kind of opinionatedness as a, as a good thing for the Svelte ecosystem as a whole, even though it might irritate individual developers. Sure. Yeah. Um, does anyone have an, uh, a question they'd like to ask? rather than me just reading from the uh, comment section. Any more hands to go up? So there's a, a question about the test here, um, which I can kind of half answer. So as I said, V is used by Svelte under the hood. And V is a development tool and bundler that comes kind of pre-configured for a lot of stuff. And there's a new test runner framework thing called V test, which I've been using at work, which is really, really nice. And it's really nice because it has the same kind of performance profile. So you change one file, it rebuilds one file. So it's really, really fast uh, at dev time. But the other nice thing is if you're already using V, you can just use your V kind of config for your tests. So like people are so used to having like the CRA config or the kind of Next.js config and then duplicating all of that in kind of like ingest or at least half of it in jest or whatever. And um, with V test, like, you know, you can kind of unify those things, which is nice. Um, does it work with Selkit? I don't know. Um, it works with Svelte. <laughs> Whether it works like well with Svelte Kit, I don't know. Um, I guess like I guess it depends what you're testing. So if you're testing normal kind of functions, if you're unit testing stuff, if you're testing components, that will work fine. If you want to test the whole app with something like kind of Playwright, I know that the Beat test team are looking at those kinds of like Playwright, Cypress, all those kinds of things. I know there's work in that direction, but it's not as well kind of padded out as the unit testing story and the kind of integration. And by integration, I kind of mean kind of emulated DOM environment in node sort of situation. That's kind of um, more mature at the minute than the true browser testing. And in terms of actually testing a full cell tap in VTest, I imagine that's quite difficult at the minute. Um, we recommend, generally we recommend kind of play, or we've kind of like avoided recommending testing tools, but we've now added an option basically to the create spell. Do you want to use Playwright for testing? And it comes with a basic Playwright kind of setup. We're using Playwright in the kit repo, the cell kit repo, and we found it really, really good. It's kind of like faster and kind of more, makes more sense and comes with the features we need to test versus something like Cypress. So we do generally kind of have been kind of recommending Playwright. Maybe VTest will be a better integration. Maybe it will deliver a better experience and that becomes uh, recommended. Right now it's not. Um, I know some people are working on getting VTest to work well with SvelteKit, um, but I haven't heard anything concrete at the minute. Very good. Okay, um, any more questions?
or is it time for a um, <clears throat> five, 10 minute break? Oh, here we go. Uh, what are the resources to go to if you want to start contributing? Asked Antonio. Um, I think Svelte Kit is easier to contribute than Svelte. It's a simpler project, um, especially if you've got like a web background. It's also um, more present in people's minds. There are definitely parts of the Svelte code base that I'm not sure anybody knows what they're doing anymore because they've written so long ago by Rich. Um, there's Svelte isn't, I actually kind of had a question like this before in Discord as well. There isn't really any great documentation on Svelte architecture if you're not familiar with the tool. So really you've kind of just got to kind of punish yourself, pick up an issue and try to kind of walk your way through the compiler and understand it a little bit. Um, with SvelteKit, it's a little bit, it's, you know, it's more fresh in our minds because it's more recent, but there's more people working on it at the minute. So you've got kind of like better chance of someone um, knowing how to kind of guide you. It's kind of, so self kit would be where I would go. Go to the repo, take a look at some um, issues. You don't have to contribute just by writing code. However, we need more documentation. We need more examples. We need issues, need triaging. So if you can kind of go through and, generate reproductions for issues, if you can kind of like go and help write blog posts, talk about kind of kit, do talks. So there's lots and lots of where you can contribute to Svelte and to kit. And it doesn't always have to be um, code. But if you do want to write code, we've got a contributors, a contributing channel on Discord. So if you have any questions, kind of come there. We have some basic contributing guidelines in the repos. And I would look for needs help issues. I don't know if we have many issues with kind of good first issue labels. Maybe we should kind of do more of that. Um, but if you're still not sure where to start after looking through the issues, come and reach out to us uh, on Discord and we'll, we'll try and kind of point you 